We'll see if this works. Good morning. It's lovely to be here with you. And congratulations to all of those of you who uh, came away this morning with special pudding and shirts, <laughs> full shirts and, uh, and awards. Thank you for your contributions to our community, uh, strivers and, and innovators. It's such an important energy that you bring to the endeavor of higher education. It's a real privilege uh, to be here among you all uh, this morning. I wanted to actually, as the folks from NYU who are here know, I'm going to ask you to do a little calisthenics um, and as a starting point. And it struck me that um, there are some of you in the room who probably go back to having been involved in JSIG since its founding in 1999. If you'd stand up for a minute and just let us see if any of you are here, that would be way cool. It's okay, it doesn't do any damage to your resume. <laughs> In fact, it enhances your resume. Thank you. Now, how about Sakai? That's 2004, right? How many of you are, come with the credentials of having been in on the origins of Sakai back then? Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Now, how many of you only learned to spell either JSIG or Sakai like a couple of years ago and are new? Would you stand to the community, please? Cool. Very cool. I know for me, whoops, it's going to be a little problematic. There we go. I know, I know for me, actually, spelling a perio has, has been an issue over <laughs> a couple of months. And Google doesn't have it yet. You know, are there any I's? How many R's? I keep getting directed to different places. So as a crowdsourcing activity, I want to ask you to please look up a perio as many times as possible while you're here. So we have to count, OK? And then maybe it'll show up instead of looking like a misspelling um, the next time somebody uh, searches for us. I'm a practitioner in uh, openness, not a theorist. I'm a practitioner in higher ed. In fact, at one point, I was working on a dissertation in, uh, on innovation in higher ed and instructional technology, and I'm still an ABD, too long out of that mode to ever get D. Um, but in the meantime, it's always a pleasure to come and get a few moments to think about where we are in higher ed, what openness um, means to us, and to check in on what those theorists who are active today are actually saying about it. So I want to give you a tour, there we go, with um, uh, this uh, sequence. It shows up. Come on back. There you go. I want to talk first about the miracle on the Hudson. That is, um, though I would like to brag, a distinct from NYU. Uh, which is also a kind of a miracle on the Hudson. <laughs> then I want to talk about openness. I want to talk about the how of it, the why of it, and the what um, of it, and the who, who um, is involved in openness. But the miracle on the Hudson um, that I want to start with, it'll be here soon, is this one. Down in the bottom is that airplane that Captain Sully glided into the Hudson River uh, on February, January 15th in, uh, in 2009. And you can find, this is actually an open source photo. It's not the proprietary photo. Um, but I kind of like this one because it actually shows in addition to uh, the rescue operations that were going on on the river that day, that building um, behind it and those towers on the stuff on top are actually part of my personal miracle at NYU. That's the generator on top of the building where we have one of our large data centers. And one of these days, those generators are going to carry us through the next hurricane uh, season smoothly. Um, but focus on the, on the river for the purpose of, uh, of this example. There were plenty of um, kudos for Captain Sully for the way he executed 
that recovery operation, but the real story about why he was able to do it started decades ago. And it had three main attributes, the first of which was chicken guns. Now it turns out chicken guns were used by the engineers designing jet engines back in the 70s and the 80s and the 90s to protect the engine design from blowing apart when birds got sucked into them. And there were, in fact, this weekend, very serendipitously, I was at a table with one of the chicken gun guys, and he talked about the work they did shooting chickens into the Pratt and Whitney engines to see what would happen. <laughs> and the big deal was that the engine needed to sustain that kind of an impact without go turning on fire, without uh, getting on, going on fire, and without blowing apart. Because if it blew apart, that would damage the fuselage, and then the whole plane was gone. So chicken gun engineering was a very seminal part to what happened, because it was kind of the geese that, whose feathers were found inside the engine when it was pulled up out of the river. And the fact that the engine was able to sustain not enough thrust to get them skybound, but enough thrust to keep the hydraulics and the electronics in the plane going was one of the first big survival elements uh, that made this miracle happen. And that miracle, as I say, started in about 1970 with uh, chicken guns. And you can imagine what a smelly mess. You know? yeah. <laughs> Talk about harmony. <laughs> the second innovation that made this miracle possible is a facility called fly-by-wire. You know, we usually think about airplanes as either being under the command of the pilot or on autopilot. But in fact, there's a middle way, a hybrid, as it were, that uh, because the engine sustained enough power, was able to keep going here and tell Captain Sully exactly where he was and what speed he was going and responded immediately to subtle commands that he gave that ultimately allowed him to glide the plane into the river without nose diving into the river. Those of you who are paying attention to the America's Cup races may have noticed that Oracle's um, very fancy boat nose dive in um, San Francisco Harbor on a trial run. Well, you can imagine a, a vehicle as light as that nose diving, and this plane landing and gliding along the river was a fly-by-wire success, fly-by-wire combination of computing and human hybrid uh, interaction uh, that has also been developing over several uh, decades. Third reason for this miracle able to accomplish is visible in all the boats on the river. The rescue readiness of the ferry boat guys, and in fact it was a ferry boat passenger who took the canonical picture of the captain standing on the fuselage and the, and the uh, passengers standing on the wings. Uh, but their readiness is the result of practice over a long time, and it's actually also a result of instrumenting the river. A couple of guys over at Stevens Institute of Technology in Hoboken were tracking the sensing devices that showed what was the tide, what was the force of the river, and where were the other traffic on the river at the time, so that um, they were able to let in real time the rescue guys know, for example, there's one ferry that had to back out of the way. You sort of see it there a little bit to the left of the plane because the um, air, the, the chute that had come out of the plane turned into a life raft. And the life raft was floating between the plane and the ferry. So the ferry needed to know to back up, but not to back up into any other traffic on the river and had to back up so that the ebb tide flowing out of the river didn't take the whole show under the Verrazano Bridge. So this miracle 
really turns out to be not such a miracle after all, not such a surprise. And Stephen Johnson, in his new book that's cited there, um, says it very plainly. It was certainly an individual triumph, but it was only made possible by decades of collaboration in an environment that was not top-down, and it was executed also in an environment of collaboration that was not top-down, a collaboration of state institutions and corporate research and individual research, all sharing to pull that miracle off. Johnson goes on to talk about three different kinds of networks, and he starts with the one that's on the far left, which um, he describes as having been innovated actually in Paris, in France, their railway system. And the railway system hub was Paris, and it made it possible for France to be very efficient in getting stuff from Paris to the rest of the country, much more so than the Germans were able to do with a much more cobbled together uh, system that actually looked more like the one on, the, on your right. There's a, uh, Johnson talks about the evolution of looking at this kind of a network, a top-down network, and discovering that in complex situations where change is happening in lots of places at the edge, that's probably efficient enough to make decisive change, but it's inefficient from the point of view of being able to understand what's going on at the edge and incorporating edge knowledge and edge need into the overall solution. And so it was really in the 60s that um, the foundation sketches of what became the ARPANET and then the internet developed into the fishnet um, picture that you see on the right, and it's been in this context of this kind of fishnetted network that we work together in higher ed, that the internet um, has come to be what it is, but that we're not only boxes and wires connected in this kind of fishnet mode, we're people and ideas and contributions also connected in this fishnet mode to make progress. I'm going to come back to these images in a little while. I want to take a break for now and talk about the other miracle on the Hudson, uh, New York University. So New York University has been around for quite a while. It's a private university founded in 1831. It's one of the largest private not-for-profit universities in the world. Um, we've got about 50,000 students, 40,000 of them equally divided into undergraduate and graduate degree programs, and we've got about 16,000 uh, employees, about 7,500 of which are faculty or instructional staff. Um, in New York, we have 14 schools that are part of the university, and um, we're affiliated with Polytechnic Institute of New York. In fact, we're working on consummating in a year or so from now that affiliation by merging poly into the university to become our engineering school, our 15th um, school. We have been building for a long time on very much connectivity internationally. Fifty years ago, uh, NYU started its first study away program, and we are accomplishing now a vision of becoming what we call a global network university, where the N in network stands not for boxes and wires, but for the network of people and ideas. And um, that networking has been based on um, a model of peer open. So when you look at where NYU is today, we have three, well, 2.7 um, portal campuses. Our portal campuses are ones where a student enters as a freshman and completes and earns an NYU degree um, and could stay at that site for their entire undergrad or graduate um, career. 
So the portal campuses are NYU New York, which will shortly um, breach the East River and uh, encompass Brooklyn as well as Manhattan. NYU Abu Dhabi, which opened in 2011, we will graduate our first undergraduate class in Abu Dhabi next uh, spring at our new campus, which is a 30 or so building campus um, that's now nearing the end of construction. And we're starting to look at where to put the fiber and the wires and the electricity associated with that construction. And then this fall, 2013, we'll be opening NYU Shanghai. Uh, we've just admitted our first class of about 150 students, um, half of whom will be Chinese nationals, and the other half have come from 30 or 40 countries uh, around the world. In all of these cases, the students who start out in either New York or Abu Dhabi or Shanghai have the opportunity to study away at any one of 14 uh, academic centers that are centers for faculty to do research as well as for students, undergrads and graduates to uh, study away. In that 14, the three portal campuses are also counted. So, for example, this spring we had juniors from Abu Dhabi doing their study away semester in New York City. Uh, one of the complexities of this was declared by our provost, uh, Dave McLaughlin, who made the pronouncement that um, there needs to be seamless circulation of faculty and students, not so seamless for staff, we're a little more clunky, but seamless circulation for faculty and students able to participate in all parts of the network. This is a pretty big challenge when you think of all of the academic programs that we have underway and making sure that any student or faculty member who wants to participate in this network of people and ideas can do so without losing progress on their academic and research work um, while they're wherever else uh, they may be and still stay connected with all of the different micro communities at NYU with which they may be affiliated. So we have student clubs that span the campuses and the study away sites. We have faculty research groups that span other sites uh, as well as home. We have postdocs who are deployed abroad working on projects that are both funded in the U.S. and other projects that are funded in Abu Dhabi, soon to be uh, also funded um, in, in, uh, in Shanghai. NYU's IT uh, is viewed as a strategic asset, and we actually manage and govern IT. Um, with lots of participation by people who are not geeks uh, across the range of activities at the university. So there's an IT strategy group that's headed by a vice chancellor um, to which I and another colleague are staff that brings together the academic and administrative leaders who chair these specific strategy groups for teaching and learning, for research, for community life, which is a big deal when you think about um, being able to seamlessly participate throughout the university, and for administration. And then underpinning the whole thing, we're looking for a shared common infrastructure of services as well as boxes and wires and tools and applications that needs to continually be updated in order to support the forward motion of this entire enterprise. I want to focus in for a minute on instru our instructional technology ecosystem at NYU and acknowledge the wonderful success that our team led by Francesca, who's going to be speaking later today, if you want to hear more um, particulars, has had with our migration from Blackboard um, which was pretty pervasive across our whole institution to Sakai so that this spring we brought up in as smooth a migration as I have ever witnessed in all my time in higher ed um, over 6,800 
courses, over 38,000 students, about 5,000 or so faculty members into using um, the Sakai platform um, for pretty much the, the first time. We still have a few of our schools to go this summer, um, but I was able to walk into every university leadership team meeting this fall without having to apologize for a thing and in fact get kudos every once in a while from um, folks who were so surprised at how smoothly this transition has gone. Now we have Sakai very tightly integrated with our student information system and accessible through our NYU home portal and those purple boxes and I would add to that our service link, service tracking and self uh, available knowledge base of health are an ecosystem that we expect to keep alive and running for a long time. In the green, you can see the areas in which we're experimenting with elements of um, instructional, specifically course useful tools that we expect to make available for specific courses in both hybrid mode and online mode. You know, at NYU leadership was feeling kind of behind um, with the rest of the fever that's going on in online education until we did an inventory. I mean, one of the things that's true about the cacophonous place of NYU is we don't know all that much about ourselves as a whole. There's lots of pockets of knowledge of different pieces, but coming together and knowing ourselves as a whole is actually one of our challenges. What we discovered is we have already about 400 completely online courses, many of them packaged in degree formats, largely um, graduate level or certificate level or continuing um, programs. And we have another 700 that are um, available fully online but not, uh, not in a degree program itself. And so we're already feeling like we've got our feet wet and we're actually earning revenue um, in this realm. And that was a comforting finding for particularly our trustees who were feeling as if uh, we might be going the way of the dinosaur anytime uh, soon. And, but in addition, we've made an investment choice at the IT strategy group level to invest in people resources and in tools to incorporate more technology in course specific ways and in courses that can be used across the GNU so that students can continue their academic progress wherever they may be um, in our global footprint and so that we can also begin experimenting with offering more fully online modes. But we expect to do that in the context of uh, Sakai, which we call NYU Classes, and our NYU Albert student system, so that that's the place where uh, you will register, you will add drop courses, there will, you will pay, uh, you will get financial holds, and we will keep track of your transcripts. Um, regardless of what other tools you may use. And that's also the place where through our classroom equipped technologies, faculty and students will have easy access to enter these uh, new tools through Sakai, um, either in classroom itself or, or out of classroom. So let me go back now to this uh, why of openness slide. And I want to um, start out by saying that I think um, it's actually very well articulated in the document that um, the joint working group of JSIG and Sakai published last April. And um, I had an outline to read you, but I'm going to skip that part and suggest that you go back and read it for yourself. The telling part to me, though, is in, the, um, in a snippet from one paragraph. There is a growing recognition from higher education IT leadership that standard, closed, and proprietary 
business software is often a poor fit for the academic enterprise, that it frequently does not serve often unique processes supporting our institutions, and that critically, it may actually act to stifle innovation at exactly the economic and educational inflection points where innovation is most required. Now, if you look at these three models of network, I think one of the issues we have in higher ed is that we actually live within all three of them all the time. At NYU, for example, you could look at our administrative services, think of our student information system. It's one of those centralized networks on the, on the left. You could think about how we develop academic programs, specifically with leadership in disciplines and departments, as a highly decentralized process, like the one in the middle. So faculty are used to working with their colleagues in their discipline, developing curriculum, developing sequences of courses, and developing the academic um, assessment criteria that um, are, need to be used and need to be addressed in order to succeed. But then the actual delivery of teaching and learning is a much more fishnetted process. And there's much more need for understanding what's needed at the edges that is impossible to know in the far left example of network. A much more requirement to be able to be responsive to iterative changes. That's how we operate in teaching and learning. We try a thing, it succeeds, then we go further. We try another thing, it bombs, and we go back and fix it before we show up in class the next week. Much more amenable to the other end of the spectrum. So we are not living in just one model of network of people and ideas. We are living in multiple ones, and that presents us all with the challenge that those of you who've been involved in JSIG and in Sakai from the very beginning can't help but recognize in your own institutions and as we try to work together, because none of the technology networks is even intended to be represented by these three different models that we all serve every day. Then there's another challenge, the Iron Triangle, it's called. And it was presented in a report from a council of higher ed presidents, um, <clears throat> which is reported again in an article uh, in this month's Educause review by uh, a man who was the deputy director for post-secondary education with the Bill and Melissa Gates Foundation. That's the, sorry, the double citation down at the bottom. There are three factors linked in an unbreakable reciprocal relationship. Now you think Iron Chef, okay, this is Iron Triangle, unbreakable reciprocal relationship such that any change in one will inevitably impact the others. In other words, every positive improvement comes with an equal but probably negative trade-off on one or the other of the elements. Unfortunately, the iron triangle remains strong. Now, Josh observes that fortunately, the resolve and the creativity of higher education innovators, us and our colleagues, are producing all sorts of solutions that have the potential to break the triangle. Now, I actually resonate with quite a lot of what Josh has to say in his article, and I commend it to you, but I'm thinking we're not breaking that triangle anytime soon, we're probably um, adjusting it in some fashion that holistically we don't know yet. But the challenge for higher ed moving from now in 2013 for, say, just another decade is how are we together 
going to make progress in this complicated network of people and ideas world in which we live with the, within the context of one more iron thing, an iron uh, triangle. So what is openness? And the argument that people are making is it's not going to be solved by a central network. It's not even going to be solved by a decentral approach. It's going to have to be open. And here are the attributes um, that Stephen Johnson, in his new book, uh, asserts are requirements of an open network, building on understanding the success and, and of, the, uh, of the internet and, and its evolution. <clears throat> so it is compressed, comprised of equals, it is decentralized, there's no central control system, it is dense, it is diverse, not only of us who are toiling in the techno vineyard, but it brings in the ideas and work of other partners. It prefers open exchange over private property. It has mechanisms for assigning value, maybe not market value, but awards and shirts, or post your code and have other people use it, citation type um, values. And it shares a common interest in making continuous progress forward, although it probably has very diverse definitions of what the hell continuous progress means. And that's actually the strength rather than the failing of the network. There are risks associated with an open network, and there are um, specific risks from the point of view of CIOs and the people um, to whom we report. CIO Magazine listed these top fives as risks of joining open source um, or community sourced initiatives. And, um, and I added the sixth, which is who's the decider? We used to have one of those. But not necessarily in this place. And you know, that's actually for the purpose of innovation and accommodating the needs at the edge, having not just one decider is a good thing and an important attribute of openness. So what we're really looking for in um, terms that Josh, in his article, begins to articulate, he talks about a grand partnership between people who have the financial interests of the academy and people who have the quality and access interests of the academy in their forefront. And I would just edit his article and say it's not a between partnership, it's an among partnership and we're part of that among. So here's what I mean, this network. We need to be able to graft a central view of administrative services with all of the strengths of a decentral view of developing academic programming, with the fishnet view of ideas and flow of scholarship that accommodates um, teaching and learning, as well as um, the best of the research that, uh, that we do. There's another author that, uh, author that I grew fond of um, this year. His name is Mark Lesser. And he's written a new book. He wrote the book um, Less, as a matter of fact. Uh, it's not a bad title for remembering both the book and his name. Um, but his newest book is actually called Know Yourself, Forget Yourself. And in that book, he talks about the paradoxes that we need to be able to manage in order to navigate anything in this world. Lester's not a techie, but he says, I have come to believe that embracing and responding to paradox, turning our assumptions upside down, expecting the unexpected, 
comfortably holding two opposing viewpoints at the same time is the key to waking up to ourselves and the present moment and discovering the right thing to do. He closes by saying paradox is a doorway to insight. So I want to give the last word back to Stephen Johnson. We have a theory of peer networks. We have the practice of building them. And we have results. We know that peer networks can work in the real world. The task now is to see how far they can take us. Thank you. Comments, feedback, thoughts? Hearing none, I think that's all that's down. No, no, we're Sorry. just thinking. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> we're thinking. We're thinking. Okay, we're thinking. got it. Perfect. Thanks. Yes. Um, Actually, given, I don't know whether you saw David Ackerman's presentation, but I'll bet you've hopefully seen a little bit of it. We where, discussed. <laughs> <laughs> where, um, where he was talking about LMS market share. And um, one of the findings was actually that perhaps open source is slightly smaller in sheer numbers than has been sort of uh, reported. And I'm wondering, given sort of your, your talk, if you could comment a little bit on where you think things are going. Sure. I think it's inevitable that there will be elements of this ecosystem that will continue to be strong components of open source, will need to be, because I don't think there's any one corporation, any one innovator, any one resource that's going to be able to knit the whole of what we're trying to do together. And I think we all need to continue to keep these kinds of collaborations in which we're engaged in a parallel vibrant and lively. It may even be that the next edition of what we do together looks different from what we've done together up to now. But to me, that does not mean the death of open source. That means the progress. Um, that we've made so far, and the opportunity to build upon that progress uh, to do next things. Thanks for thinking. <laughs> Could you comment more on the question you asked, who is the decider, and perhaps make that concrete at N NYU? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> There's not one decider at NYU. There's a, there's a bunch of um, myths, I think, in some ways, about decision making at NYU. And, and it's something that we've been actually recently talking quite a lot about. You may know that um, at NYU this year, faculty have voted several expressions of um, lacking confidence in um, the leadership of the university. And certainly, um, the tradition at NYU and at other universities is that faculty are deciders. So are trustees deciders. So are administrators deciders. And one of the times when that kind of diffused decision making works is when things are going pretty well and incremental change is the right kind of change. But when one or the other or the other of the elements get nervous about how fast things are going or how slow things are going, that balance gets shifted. And I think we're in a time now of that balance shifting at different institutions. 
in different ways. <clears throat> and so certainly at NYU, we're working on making sure faculty not only have a voice, they know they have a, a voice. Um, and, um, and that actually is apparent in um, a faculty working group that was convened this year by the deans um, to look at the whole landscape of instructional technology resources and ask the question, should NYU join a MOOC? Uh, what should NYU do about online instruction? Um, unfortunately, that report is not going to be published for like another month. Um, otherwise, I would have said something about it. But stay tuned. This is a really important deciding element in our um, culture. And we're working hard to make sure that we're listening to the right voices in the right way. On the other hand, those of you who have been change agents for any length of time know you can't satisfy all the people all the time. And you need to be able to read the river and decide in your own um, work where you're going to put your energies and who you're going to try to influence for getting the next thing going. So in a lot of ways, and in work that we're doing really consciously in IT at NYU, we're developing leadership skills across the spectrum of our IT professionals, not only those who work in the central units, but also those who work in the schools and departments. Each one of us uh, has not only an opportunity, but really an obligation in a time like this to be sensing. It's like those sensors that were in the Hudson River. You know, Every one of the sensors that were somewhere in the vicinity of that plane played a role in figuring out what could happen next. And that's true in this paradigm shift time, I believe, that, that we're in in higher ed. None of us has the whole uh, story. In fact, there's, you know, there's a, a joke. Well, it's not always funny, depending on who you're telling to. Um, <clears throat> about a president of a university, which probably many names, um, who was looking to fill a blue ribbon, blue ribbon panel and went looking in a deli for um, brains. And the deli owner said, well, I have um, Dean Brains, 50 bucks a pound. I have Faculty Brains, 500 bucks a pound. I have CIO Brains, five grand a pound. The president said, oh, how could it possibly be more expensive for a CIO than for Dean or faculty member? The deli guy said, you have no idea how many CIOs it takes to get a pound of brain. <laughs> <laughs> so it's so subtle, you know, we are not the deciders, but, but we're definitely the instigators. And we're definitely going to be the for blamers if we miss uh, the tide, you know, and the plane glides under the Verrazano Bridge or uh, under the Golden. Okay, right? So we've got to be in the game. We've got to have all our technical skills and all our listening and leadership and influence skills at the table and not expect that somebody else is going to decide. That's the actual um, impact of this fishnet network world that we're in. Thank you very much.